Welcome to Star Trek Selections, The Next Generation. Today I will be discussing my top five episodes of Season 7. Number five, Preemptive Strike, written by Rene Ishavaria from a story by Naran Shankar and directed by Patrick Stewart. Ro Laren returns with advanced tactical training and a promotion to lieutenant. No sooner does she come back when Vice Admiral Nechayev turns up, never a good sign, wanting Ro to infiltrate the Maquis, a group of freedom fighters who have been stepping up their attacks on the Cardassians lately. Nobody feels good about this, particularly Ro, since her people, the Bajorans, got the worst of the Cardassians over the years. However, she does her duty and goes on the mission, infiltrating a Marquis cell, led by a sweet old man named Macius. Starfleet sets up a trap for the Marquis, which Ro is supposed to lead them into. She's not happy about it, but she agrees, even steals some supplies from the Enterprise. However, when Macius is killed in a Cardassian attack, it's the last straw. Ro warns off the Marquis and joins them. Michelle Forbes' Ro Laren was one of my favourite things about Next Gen, and she was asked to star in Deep Space Nine, which she refused. A shame, because I would have liked that show much better if she was in it. However, she did return to wrap up Ro's story in this episode. She does turn up in another Trek show much later, but that's a different video. And I love her performance here. This is a more measured and reasonable Ro, but she still has that fire and passion which made her such a compelling character. However, her intelligence and sensitivity are now just as prominent, making her even more interesting. Apart from Michelle Forbes, there is also some great work from Jonathan Frakes, and particularly Patrick Stewart, who masterfully conveys the bond and mutual respect between Picard and Roe. Preemptive Strike is a well-written character piece with a lot to say about tyranny and rebellion, but most of all it is a showcase for Michelle Forbes and a fitting culmination of her character arc. And a heartfelt send-off for a great character. For a couple of decades, at least. Could you tell Captain Picard something for me? Of course. What is it? Tell him I'm sorry. So long, Rob. Take care of yourself. Goodbye, Will. Number four, Emergence. Written by Joe Minoski, from a story by Brannon Braga, and directed by Cliff Bowl. Data is practicing his Prospero on the holodeck when a train almost runs over he and Picard. That wasn't in the program. Soon the Enterprise jumps into warp on its own, saving the ship from being destroyed. But that's kind of weird, so the crew look into it. They find strange nodes throughout the ship which have been created by the computer. They find out the ship's computer is taking control of the ship via the holodeck. When they enter the holodeck, to fi- they find the- an Orient Express program with a bunch of characters pulled from other programs, who all seem on intent on reaching a particular destination. When the crew interfere, they are asked to leave. A strange structure, similar to the nodes, begins to form in the cargo bay. It is soon discovered that the Enterprise itself is t- attempting to create a life form. However, even though there is resistance, the holodeck characters soon realise they need the crew's help, and a new life form is born as a result. I only recently discovered that many people hate this episode, but I can't really figure out why. It's classic Star Trek. A new life form is discovered and aided by the crew. It's fun, creatively told, and very philosophical. But I've noticed that a lot of people don't take too kindly to Brennan Braga's big, high-concept story swings. See Star Trek Voyager's Threshold. But I kind of love them, and the braga Minoski combo is something I always enjoy. Then you put it in the hands of an accomplished Trek director like Cliff Bowl, and you get a highly enjoyable episode with Data and Geordi doing their clever engineering and science stuff, Deanna actually getting to flex her psychology muscles, and the damn Enterprise becomes sentient for a while. I kind of wish they'd kept it like that for the last couple of, couple of episodes, but a later series really delves into the sentient ship thing, so it's cool. Anyway, despite the haters, Emergence is still one of my favourite episodes of TNG's final season. Number three, Phantasms, written by Brennan Braga and once again directed by Patrick Stewart. Data is having nightmares. Workmen are tearing apart a conduit, and when Data emits a high-pitched noise, the workmen tear him apart. He is disturbed by these dreams and seeks help from Counselor Troy, and also a holographic Sigmund Freud. 
Meanwhile, the warp drive isn't working, preventing the captain from getting to an admiral's dinner, which he has put off numerous times. Data's nightmares continue, with one featuring Beverly sucking out Riker's brain via a straw in his head, and Deanna as a cake. Things take a turn when Data starts seeing bizarre mouth-type things on the crew and elements from his nightmares during his waking hours. Seeing one of these mouths on Deanna's shoulder prompts him to stab her there. Data is then confined until the crew figure out what's going on, and it turns out that the mouths Data has been seeing are actually alien parasites. After a tour through Data's dreams, they realise that high-pitched noise is actually the key to destroying them. Phantasms is both genuinely disturbing at times and very funny, sometimes at the same time. Good old Braga being super weird again. There are some great moments in this episode. All the dream sequences are perfectly realised. I'd absolutely watch a horror movie directed by Patrick Stewart, because there's some excellent horror sensibilities on display. And the humour is just as well done. Tell him he is a pretty cat. And a good cat. I will feed him. But it's those nightmares which stand out the most. The direction, the production design by Richard D. James, and Jonathan West's cinematography all play their part. West in particular seems to have quite a feel for horror. I'm surprised he hasn't done more in that area. Plus, the score and sound design also contribute greatly to the atmosphere. So, for the fun and the frights, Phantasms is easily one of my favourite episodes of the final season of The Next Generation. Number 2, Lower Decks, directed by Gabriel Beaumont, written by René Eschevaria, from a story by Ronald Wilkerson and Jean-Louise Mathias. This episode focuses entirely on some largely unknown junior officers. Sam Lavelle, played by Dan Gautier, Torek, Alexander Enberg, Patty Yasutaki as Nurse Alyssa Ogawa, the only genuinely recurring character of the four, and Shannon Phil reprising her role as Seto Jaxa from the episode The First Duty, where she was one of the cadets involved in an accident and cover-up at the Academy. Rounding out the group is a young bartender named Ben, played by Bruce Beatty. A promotion is apparently up for grabs, and the two main contenders are Sito and Lavelle. The bulk of the episode revolves around them. Sito's troubled past and Lavelle's worries that Commander Riker hates him, despite the fact that they are clearly so similar. It is a largely inconsequential story to begin with, but the characters are compelling and the script is excellent. But what makes the episode so good is where it goes and how it gets there. And I don't want to tell you, just in case you missed it, but suffice it to say, I find it to be one of the most affecting and memorable episodes of the entire series. It's great to see Patty Yazataki getting a chance to expand her role beyond Dr. Crush's occasional sidekick. Dan Gautier is, has the perfect amount of cockiness to be a kind of proto Riker. He even, even tries on the classic Riker maneuver at some point, the role of Torek will go on to give Alexander Enberg a recurring role on Star Trek Voyager as basically the same guy with a slightly different name. But the episode really belongs to Shannon Phil as Seto Jaxa. If you didn't want me on your ship, you should have said so when I was assigned to it. It's not your place to punish me for what I did at the Academy. I've worked hard here. My record is exemplary. If you're going to judge me, judge me for what I am now. Who doesn't love a redemption story? And she does a great job here. Lower Decks is actually a brilliant episode of television. So much of the episode could have been fairly boring, but the characters charm you quickly, and it has some truly inspired moments. I'm particularly fond of the way the two poker games are presented, highlighting the similarities between Lavelle and Riker. And like I said, the ending will just stay with you. It's an episode featuring none of the main cast, and it is damn near my favourite episode of Star Trek The Next Generation's final season. Number one, All Good Things, written by Brannon Braga and Ronald D. Moore, and directed by Winrich Colby. In the series finale, Captain Jean-Luc Picard finds himself jumping through time. First, about 25 years into the future, Picard is an old man, working in his vineyard, and then he finds himself seven years in the past, in a shuttle with Tasha Yar just before he takes command of the Enterprise for the first time. In the present, the Enterprise is ordered to the edge of the Romulan neutral zone to investigate a spatial anomaly. 
In the future, Picard convinces Geordi and Data to help him get there in that time to period too, using the USS Pasteur, commanded by his ex-wife, Captain Beverly Picard. With a little help from Worf, since the Klingons have now conquered the Romulan Empire. And in the past, Picard is also ordered to the neutral zone, rather than their original first mission, Farpoint Station, to look for the anomaly. In that time, the anomaly is bigger than it is in the present. But in the future, it is nowhere to be found. Before they can figure anything out, the Klingons attack the Pasteur. But the crew are rescued just in time by the Enterprise, commanded by Admiral William T. Riker. The question of why Picard is jumping through time is answered. It's Q. It's the last episode. Of course it's Q. He tells Picard this anomaly will destroy all of humanity, and that it's Picard's fault. Soon Picard finds out that it's the actions he took in all three time periods which created the anomaly, and the, the only way to fix it is to take all three enterprises into the anomaly. After seven years, Star Trek The Next Generation goes out on top with a thoughtful, entertaining, witty, and epic ride through time and space, bringing back Cole Meany's Chief Miles O'Brien from Deep Space Nine and Denise Crosby's Tasha Yar from The Dead. It bookends the series with the same trial Q started in the first episode. It gives Geordie some eyes, Data some feelings, and Jean-Luc and Beverly a tender moment. Plus, it ends with Picard joining that poker game for the first time. I believe it is up there with the greatest series finales of all time and a fitting send-off for one of the brightest lights in Star Trek's long and illustrious history. Join me next time on Star Trek Selections. However, for the moment, I will be returning to A Century of Cinema, where I will be exploring my favourite films of 1988. But Star Trek Selections will return. See you out.